Turkey's president expands his power. But opposition groups are calling the vote undemocratic. The situation in Northeast Asia continues to challenge U.S. foreign policy. We have an armada going towards the peninsula. That's a fact. It happened. It is happening, rather. My message to the people of South Korea is this. We are with you 100 percent. Stateside, a congressional race could serve as a measuring stick for President Trump's first 100 days. And I sat down with Professor Glenn Morgan to discuss the first round of French elections. This is Talking Points. Top story tonight, a French police officer is dead at the hands of a suspected radical Islamic terrorist, according to French security services. I'm Josh Carney. And I'm Mike Riccardi. French security services are investigating what they think is in all likelihood a terrorist attack. Hours ago, a man emerged from a van and shot three police officers in Paris, killing one of them before being shot dead. Investigators believe that there was only one attacker and that the danger is over. ISIS claims an Islamic State fighter carried out the attack. Here's what President Donald Trump had to say in response. Uh, it's a very, very terrible thing that's going on in the world today, but it looks uh, like another terrorist attack. And uh, what can you say? It just never ends. And we have to be strong and we have to be vigilant, and I've been saying it for a long time. The attack comes three days ahead of the first round of the French presidential elections, where five candidates are vying for one of two spots in the second round. Just one month ago, Marine Le Pen, the candidate for the National Front, a populist right-wing party, and Emmanuel Macron, an independent former economic minister and businessman, looked to have a firm lead. However, the surge of left-winger Jean-Luc Mélenchon has pulled these four candidates within 5% at the top, and in effect has knocked out Benoit Hamon out of contention. I sat down with Professor Glenn Morgan to preview Sunday's first round. I started by asking him whether or not Mélenchon has a serious chance to make it to the second round. Yes, I think he does have a chance to make it into the second round. The polls suggest that there are about anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the people haven't yet decided. So we don't know what's going to happen. And uh, it's going to be a real surprise whatever happens on Sunday. If you had to pick one person who wins this entire thing, who do you think it is? I think Macron will win. I, th I think that uh, he is the establishment candidate. He is the candidate that is pro-EU. You have to remember that 72% of the French people in, in polls say they're in favor of the euro. It will be a great surprise if he doesn't win. I think that if either Mélenchon or Le Pen win, it will be a huge blow to Europe. Uh, it will, uh, in the short term at least, wreck the economy, wreck the currency. It will be a huge change. Now, you said the French people, 72% support staying in the EU. If either Le Pen or Mélenchon win, do you think the French people stand in their way, or do you think they get what they want? I think they will both call something like a referendum. And uh, I think the shock represented by Mélenchon is less to the EU than to the French business sector. He's calling for huge increases in taxation, and that's going to lead to capital flight. And with elections coming up in Italy, in France, and in Brexit now getting underway, what do you think the future of the EU looks like, and, and will they be able to keep all of these pieces together? That's a very good question. I think that they will keep the pieces together, but they are going to experience five years of difficulty. I think one important thing to note about Le Pen is that she appeals to the young, which is a big difference from Donald Trump and from Brexit. The young people feel they've been screwed by the system, they're not doing well, and there's a youth vote with respect to Le Pen, which is new, and it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Do you think there's a greater chance that even though if, we, if Europe is able to keep the European Union together, we see more of a crackdown 
on border crossings and immigration, specifically from Middle East and, and Northern African countries? Yes, I think if Le Pen wins or even Mélenchon wins, we will see a turn towards nationalism. I think the fundamental divide in Western democracies now is between liberal globalists on one side and nationalist protectionists on the other side. Donald Trump represents a victory of the nat national protectionists, and if Le Pen or Mélenchon win, it will be another victory for the national protectionists. Our thanks to Professor Glenn Morgan. Always a pleasure having him on. The best. After the break, we'll talk Turkey and the constitutional referendum that's giving its president sweeping new powers. Don't go away. Hey, look, it's those guys. Are you good to drive? I'm fine. How many did you have? I should be fine. You should be. Go and step out of the vehicle for me. See ya, buddy. Good luck. So it turns out, buzz driving and drunk driving, they're the same thing. And it costs around $10,000. So not worth it. What are you, superheroes? Just four brothers who hate bullies and love this city. Sunday, the Turkish people voted on a constitutional amendment that grants Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan sweeping new powers. It changes the Turkish government from a parliamentary system to a presidential democracy, much like the ones seen in the U.S. and Mexico, and it could mean President Erdogan will lead the country for another decade. Meanwhile, opposition groups are demanding a recount. Talking Points International correspondent Elijah Shama is here to talk about the vote's domestic and international impact. Elijah, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So what are these opposition groups contesting? The main thing that these opposition groups are contesting is about 1.5 million votes that they say uh, were fraudulent or not carried out in a proper way. The main thing is that there have been ballot boxes that have been found to not have the official seal of the election committee on them, so basically kind of unofficial ballots, that the election committee says they are counting, and opposition groups say that's not fair, and that these votes are probably rigged. And so, like you said, people are claiming that the vote was unfair. Do you think there's real validity to that, and then what could they do moving forward? It's interesting, because I think there is uh, a fair amount of validity to these claims. We've seen, uh, leading up to the vote, a lot of really kind of skewed practices in, in the campaigning for the yes vote. Erdogan didn't even have the question on the ballot of what these people were voting for. The ballot simply said yes or no. In addition to that, he had kind of the entire state media behind him, as well as real jailing of opposition leaders and kind of intimidation of anyone who kind of stood in his way leading up to this election. So thinking that it's rigged really isn't that far-fetched. And going beyond that, we've seen many nations shift to uh, presidential democracies in the past. Now, why is this so different, or why is this uh, more of an adverse situation than the others? It's interesting because I think the reason that people are really concerned about what Erdogan is doing is because kind of after this coup, we've seen him consolidate power in this sweeping way. He's put thousands of people in jail. He's sent university heads to jail. Turkey has more journalists in jail than any other country in the world at 160. We've seen this man kind of use his power already, even when it was limited, to kind of curb opposition in a way that's very autocratic. So giving him this system of power that would grant him even more control over how the government operates is for a lot of people just a chance for Turkey to just slide completely into an autocracy in the future. And Turkey is a member of NATO, and with this change forthcoming, what exactly does that mean for NATO allies and the United States? I think a lot of NATO allies are really interested to see how this is going to play out, because when we look at it, 
Um, Erdogan's made a couple of really big U-turns on kind of his stances in foreign policy. He was hard on Iran, now he's not. He was hard on Russia, now he's not. So he's really kind of softened his stances on allies and people that the U.S. would generally were up against in, in history and recently. So it'll be interesting to see how that dynamic ties uh, plays out. Certainly something we're going to be keeping our eye on, as well as the global community, especially mm -hmm. as they reach forward to Definitely. an EU bid. Thank you, Elijah. No problem. Despite international warnings, North Korea attempted to launch another nuclear missile test Sunday. Shortly after, Vice President Mike Pence visited South Korea's capital to discuss how the administration will act in response. China is even beginning to express frustration with North Korea, a longtime ally of theirs. Talking Points International correspondent Zina Saifi is here to dissect the complexities of the conflict facing Northeast Asia. Zina, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Now, Kim Jong-un has said, if provoked, there could be all-out war. Should, North, or should Asian countries nearby North Korea and the United States, should they worry about this? Or should, is it like a false threat because North Korea in the past has had failed nuclear tests? I personally think it's just noise. I think both sides are kind of like rattling sabers. They're intimidating each other with words, but I don't think they're actually going to go through with a, a war, per se. The reason behind that is because I think the U.S. knows that if they do launch war on, on North Korea, it's not going to really be effective in dismantling the nuclear weapons program that they have. And on the other side, I don't think North Korea, they're well aware that the allies that um, the U.S. has in the region are really strong allies with the U.S. And if they do try to cause some chaos, then that's going to provoke an American reaction and it's going to cause a big disaster. Now, in terms of understanding those allies and specifically the nations involved in the region, China has warned that there are storm clouds brewing in light of these conflicts. Now, will China actually react? And if they were to react, what could we expect from the, uh, as an international community? I think, first, to make it clear, China is completely anti any war, or any violence happening in the region. So that's a main thing to focus on. Although what's different this time is that China is actually frustrated with the continuous activity that North Korea is causing in terms of their missile program. So, and that's even shown in the past two UN resolutions, they um, impose sanctions on uh, North Korea's economy with their, oil, with their coal exports, and then said that if this continued, they might even reduce their oil exports, which would have, de have a detrimental effect on North Korea's economy, considering how reliant they are on China. And and the South Korean president was recently impeached. During her time in office, the South Korean policy was moved closer to the United States. Now that she's gone and there's new leadership in the country, how does this change the situation? Well, I think now there's a lot of issues happening internally with South Korea. Um, president Park was a very strong ally of the United States, especially with the THAAD agreement, which is um, basically in the Korean Peninsula, if North Korea were to launch any intermediate missiles, then it would basically shoot it down. Now it seems like the next president is leaning towards the left. The, the results seem that it's more left-leaning, which means that that's going to have major implications on South Korea's foreign policy with the United States and with North Korea, because they're very critical of, you know, having renegotiations with North Korea. So although President Pen uh, Vice President Pence visited Seoul and the, the standing president, they assured a, a, an, an alliance. We don't know moving forward how that's going to pan out. Zina, thank you sir, very much for being here. Always a pleasure. Ahead, what are President Trump's plans for tax reform and how do they compare to global tax trends? We'll discuss after the break. This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly I found my voice and learned all the ways I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org.
Got a quarter. For Americans, the last day to file taxes was Tuesday. But how do our tax policies at home compare to those abroad? And can we expect policy change with the new administration? Talking Points contributor Gabrielle Caracciolo is here to discuss. Gabby, thanks for coming on. Thank you. So clearly, taxes in the United States are a very hotbed issue. However, how do they compare to global trends in taxation? So globally, what we are seeing is a steady increase in taxes over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, right now, Belgium has the highest income tax rate at nearly 56% of income. Across Europe, the average is in the 40s, uh, but the United States pays less than 36%, so this is significantly below average. Now, going beyond trends, how does the United States tax policy compare to that of other nations, and where might we be heading? So in terms of where we might be heading, it's not likely that we will um, start following this increasing trend, at least not in the next two to four years with the Republican Congress and president. But in the next 10 to 20 years, we probably will start to see a steady increase in taxes. And when do you think that we can see a concrete tax reform plan from President Trump and what may that look like? So right now, the White House is not outsourcing exact details on their plans to anyone, including the Speaker of the House. What we do know is the Trump campaign team and the Trump transition team both developed um, two separate plans that are very similar but do have some differences. So when President Trump finally does introduce the plan, we can expect to see a combination of the two. And some of the ideas that uh, we probably will see are a reduction in the corporate tax rate to 15%, giving people a child care tax rate and keeping the capital gains rate as is, which does differ from most other GOP plans that would actually lower the capital gains rate and benefit the wealthy. But as for an exact date, some reports are saying sometime in August, but there's no real um, significant. And following what had happened with the health care bill, and we have a budget coming up in a, a week and a half, really, this is going to be a very hotbed issue, and, and I don't possibly see how President Trump will get everything he wants. Certainly may be able to push forward some things, but it's, I mean, right now the political climate in Washington, D.C., everybody's at each other's throats. Absolutely. This is not going to be easy. The political contention, especially on an issue as fraught as tax reform, is going to be a huge move for the Republicans and could cost them a lot of political clout going forward. So something we'll be keeping an eye on. Gabby, thanks so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Without a car, options have been limited to traditional modes of public transportation in the state of New York. Until now, Talking Points correspondent Connor White unpacks what the New York state budget means for New York residents and local taxi companies. In May of 2011, Uber came to New York City, but was limited to the city streets of the Big Apple. Now, Uber, Lyft, and other rideshare services are coming to Syracuse. Last week, New York passed a $163 billion budget, which included provisions to allow ride-sharing businesses to operate in all parts of the Empire State. The recently passed budget allows ordinary cars and their drivers like you see behind me to join the ranks of Uber, Lyft, and other ride-share services. Governor Cuomo said ride-sharing is bringing transportation into the 21st century, and we are committed to ensuring that it becomes a reality statewide. However, that reality can do serious harm to local taxi companies. Taxi companies and their drivers feel cheated by the budget and have distaste for the state legislators that push the provisions through. Yes, this is all I will say. You know, Uber is kind of a criminal enterprise, or I don't know how the politicians are doing that. I just don't think it's right. You know, taxi business been around Syracuse forever, and now they got to come in and ruin it for people like me, you know. In spite of their concerns, many legislators in Albany are proud of their efforts. Senator Tim Kennedy shared Cuomo's hopes that New York can now join the 21st century. Cuomo went on to say that it provides economic opportunity and a cost-effective alternative to transportation, and students tend to agree with the governor. People feel differently about it. I personally am going to be happy about it just because I'm always taking a cab everywhere. And right now I use the Suburban app, but sometimes it's un really unreliable. 
Reporting for Talking Points, Connor White, Citrus TV. When we get back, Talking Points correspondent Paul Dwyer will give us some insight into the results of Georgia's 6th Congressional District vote. Stay with us. They told me a bottle couldn't dream. That I would never become a superhero. But I learned how to fly. Just to come back in a new disguise. And be the hero that I've always wanted to be. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day, I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. After Georgia's special election Tuesday, Democrat John Ossoff and Republican Karen Handel will move on to a runoff election in June to vie for representation of the 6th District. Heading into Tuesday, many saw this election as the first indication of President Trump's popularity or lack thereof. We talked with District 6 native and Talking Points contributor Paul Dwyer about the feelings at home leading up to this pivotal race. I, I was talking to uh, a lot of people and they said that down in Georgia 6, like they'd never seen um, anything like this. I mean, there was support on the ground every single day. Whenever they would go out and drive, they would see people on the streets holding up signs. Uh, the, their phones were ringing off the hook. If, the people who still had landlines, those phones were ringing off the hook. And then um, people said, uh, a couple of people I talked to would not watch the news or would turn off their TVs completely because it was just infiltrated by ad after ad after ad. Democratic candidate John Ossoff won 48% of the vote, falling just short of the 50% requirement that would have prevented a runoff. Paul tells us he thinks that was that was Azoff's best chance of winning and, uh, and that he faces a tough road ahead. So him not winning last night, getting that 48% so close, um, may hurt him a little bit because you've already seen um, the second or the third place uh, finisher, Bob Gray. He's gotten behind uh, Karen Handel. And it's a lot of the Republican support is getting behind Karen Handel. And with the district, how it is, she fits the mold of the not too conservative uh, Republican that this district uh, has traditionally supported. Our thanks to Paul Dwyer. Again, always a great interview. We had him on a few weeks ago. Glad to have him back. As always. You know the drill here at Talking Points. We value in-depth coverage of the world's most pressing issues. But some stories inevitably don't capture mainstream attention. This week, we have three important stories you may have missed. A new app is attempting to address the trend of news being increasingly tailored to our interests. The app is called Twain, and it was launched last Friday with the purpose of providing an overview of the most popular news stories trending across the Internet. Twain has no editors. Instead, stories are selected using hundreds of algorithm, algorithms that detect what stories are getting the most traffic. The founders of the app say he hopes to distribute information in a way that isn't in a bubble. According to a report from NYU's Brennan Center for Justice, crime is at historic lows. The new report shows that the national crime rate has decreased dramatically. The report also shows that although crime rises in some years, it isn't indicative of long-term trends. National crime rate peaked in 1991 at nearly 6,000 crimes per 100,000 people and has fallen to nearly half that. Despite security concerns, conservative commentator Ann Coulter says she still plans on speaking at UC Berkeley next Thursday. 
UC Berkeley officials canceled the event fearing riots after violent protests broke out when a previous conservative speaker was coming to campus. After Berkeley told her they couldn't find a stable venue, uh, a suitable venue, Coulter's people said she will definitely be there on the 27th. She accused the university of favoring liberal speech over conservative speech. When we get back, Josh and I will take a, will talk about the stories we're following in the weeks ahead. What's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning. Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be and give you stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. Okay, but remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Here we go. We're gonna go out there to rage. Gonna get wet. All right, here we go. Oh, no. oh, no. Oh, oh yeah, yes. So much fun. Yeah, in the weeks ahead, two major things are catching our eye. In light of O'Reilly's recent departure from Fox News Network, I'll be looking ahead to how conservative media will position a new de facto leader as the voice of the right. O'Reilly has been the face of the station and for much of conservative-leaning media for 15-plus years, and his departure exemplifies a critical juncture for Fox and the media. After Megyn Kelly's departure, Roger Ailes being forced to step down, and now O'Reilly on his way out, Fox is facing a troubling prospect. Who will be the new face of the brand? With the American people just having elected the most media-savvy conservative in decades, this should be a time when the right side of the media spectrum flourishes. The hardlining fringe voices of InfoWars' Alex, Alex Jones and conservative talk radio's Rush Limbaugh certainly point to the direction conservative media is heading. Who will rise to the top spot at Fox and who will forge a new path for conservative media? These are the questions I'll continue to ask and stories that I'll be looking ahead to in the coming weeks and months. Tonight, I'm looking ahead to nine days from now, April 29th, President Trump's 100th day in office. Through the first 91 days, we've seen some promises kept, like backing out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. On the other hand, some promises have been broken, like naming China a currency manipulator. As the arbitrary deadline approaches, so does a firm one. On day 99, federal funding will run out for several government agencies. If Congress fails to pass a spending bill, day 100 will be clouded with a partial government shutdown. Senate Republicans need at least eight Democrats to avoid a filibuster, but could we see a repeat of the failed Obamacare replacement? Will members of the House Freedom Caucus counteract the Democrats? With a tough battle clearing, gearing up, excuse me, watch for what priorities of President Trump make the bill. Federal funds for the border wall? Increased military spending? Only time will tell. And that's all the time we have for tonight. In the meantime, check out CitrusTV.com for all things Talking Points. You'll find episodes, segments, and blog posts on our personal page. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next week. For Talking Points, I'm Mike Riccardi. And I'm Josh Carney. Go Rangers. <laughs>